Today I want to talk about, I want to go back to talking about shortcuts and the so-called long cuts with reference to therapy. And the, the idea is that when we are feeling in mental distress, then the last thing we're interested in is the long cut. The long cut meaning where there's no shortcut. So in other words, we're very interested indeed in any kind of shortcuts that might be on offer. And that of course is when everyone comes <coughs> rolling up with their patented shortcuts to sell to us. And that's an ongoing business <coughs> that's been going on for a very long time, I'd say. People selling the shortcuts. Now what we can say to tie this in with the topic of the predator is to say <clears throat> that if there is someone selling us a shortcut or telling us about a shortcut, that person is the predator. That's how the predator works. The predator, which we can also think about as thought or the ego, operates by offering us shortcuts. And because shortcuts are, as I was saying, so very, very attractive to us, this is a guaranteed strategy. It works every time, it works almost every time. So there's something about this business of buying into the idea that there's a shortcut. And what there is to this business is the immediate reward factor, the, the immediate euphoric flash that we get. It's like, wow, yes, I don't have to do that stuff. I don't have to go through that stuff. There's a shortcut. So there is pleasure in the first instance, it, it, assuming that we believe in it to any degree at all, which we do want to believe in it anyway, and it does seem plausible. Shortcuts have a way of seeming plausible. So that's the first thing. The first thing is the euphoric flash, which feels so good. And then of course, because it feels so good, we're super motivated to carry on down that road, the road of the shortcut. So then what we find out is the shortcut doesn't actually lead anywhere because they aren't any shortcuts. So this is the universal human experience, no matter, um, this is how it works, even though we it obviously and manifest in lots of different ways. So then what we have, when we find out that the shortcut doesn't go anywhere and it's a dead end and we have to go back to the drawing board, this produces a type of feeling which is the exact um, counterpoint of the, of the euphoric flash reward factor that we got when we started the journey. Obviously the better we feel when we think we can beat the system or when we think there is a shortcut is going to be just as the same as how bad we feel when we discover that there isn't. Obviously the two things are the same thing seen from different sides. So here we have it in a nutshell. This is um, what's not so great about shortcuts is that what we've really done is we've built in a delay factor about seeing the truth. And during that interval, when we don't see the truth, we get to feel good, we get to feel hopeful. So we've got pleasure at the start. We've separated pleasure and pain. We've got pleasure at the start, but then no pleasure exists without its counterbalance of pain. So then we've got the pain later on. Now, when we look at that whole process, it's really not what we were looking for. We weren't looking for false promises followed by bitter disappointments. We, we obviously weren't looking for that. We were looking for euphoria with no um, big disappointment at the end of it. But the principle is that there is no mind mediated route to get us to 
advance in life and quickly pass out the bits that we don't like. So that's a fundamental, a totally fundamental impossibility, which of course would make make you wonder what's all this business with people selling you hypnotherapy and CBT and all of that kind of stuff. So, you know, well, it, it just means that's the predator, that's all. That's, that's the thinking mind. The thinking mind manifests, manifests itself in form of strategies. All strategies belong to the predator. Just as Wei Wu Wei says, all methods belong to the I concept. It's a parallel statement. But it's so hard to argue the case, not because it's a complicated subject, not because it involves um, iPad mathematics and algebra and stuff, but simply because we don't want to hear it. We absolutely don't want to hear it. So this, this idea of there not being a shortcut has applications in the realm of um, spirituality as well, of course, because Probably, I imagine, for most of us, the motivation involved in pursuing the so-called spiritual path is that we want to change the way we are and be a better way, which is straight away making us vulnerable to the predator, as I said in the last instalment, because then we have all these ideas about how we want to be. and those ideas about how we'd like to be or how we could be or what it means to be more spiritual are all coming to us courtesy of thought. Thought is more than happy to furnish us with um, all of those. It's, it's a curious, it's a, it's a curiously simple thing to talk about the idea that there are no shortcuts. I was reading this 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 thread on a Krishnamurti site, and uh, there was some kind of Krishnamurti quote, which you often get a lot of in Krishnamurti sites. And some guy had objected because Krishnamurti was saying, spiritual teachers, as Krishnamurti does say, will um, bamboozle you and waste your time, and you know mess you about really you shouldn't pay heed to these to these guys get rid of them the priests and the gurus and all the rest of it Krishnamurti did used to say that a lot in all fairness so this guy who was um kind of obviously reacting to that was saying but look teachers are wise men or wise women and because of their wisdom they can tell us stuff so we don't have to make mistakes. They can say, look, do this and then do that. And they can say, well, don't do that. You shouldn't be doing that. Saving us from falling into the gutter, as this guy said. Saving us from tripping up, landing painfully in the gutter with shite all over us. And um, having to extricate ourselves from the gutter again after having probably a nasty knock to the head. So he was saying, why go through life the hard way with every, making every single mistake in the book? Get your teacher who knows all about what the mistakes are to tell you. And in, in a naive way, this makes perfect sense, of course. But really, we're, we're spiritual, spiritually so shortcutting again because there's something in us that's very keen to get to the end of the road, but without falling into the gutter on the way. And our whole attention is on, on the goal, getting to where we want to. Now, there's two things about that. One is that the goal is a thought. It's a projection of our current way of understanding things, and therefore it isn't an enlightened way of understanding things or a more spiritual way. It's just our same bog standard, crappy old way, which is totally deluded and totally useless. And we've projected that forward so as to say 
this is what it means to be a more spiritual person and we're rushing towards that goal and we ho hoping we won't make too many mistakes and uh, get sidetracked too much on the way and the other thing is that when we do that which is uh, the same thing that really that i'm saying is that when we do that what we want to do is we want to um import this ego this self construct this idea of myself into the future that's why I'm in a hurry, because it's that ego wants to get somewhere and it can't wait to get somewhere. Which is fundamentally jinxed and contradictory because it is that sense that we have of ourselves, that ego construct. That is the problem. So it's no good that ego strong construct being in a hurry to get to the end of the spiritual journey because it's not there anyway. So why would it be in a hurry? And obviously it's not going to be in a hurry, if you can see that clearly, it wouldn't be in no hurry at all. So, what we can take from that is, of course, that making our own mistakes is good. And there's often been said, that's how we learn from making mistakes. And they've got someone else learning, and then we think we can just copy them, and we don't have to go through the pain. Clearly there's something quite not right about not quite right about that, that's obviously suspect. And as William Blake says, the fool who persists in his folly shall become wise. So that's how you become wise, by being a fool, which is no problem. We can all manage that. And then persisting in our folly, in the folly which befits our foolishness. And that's no problem either, because that's what we do anyway. We persist in our folly mightily. So that's what we need to do. We need to be that fool who persists in his or her folly. So that is now, we could say, the so-called spiritual path. It doesn't sound like much of a spiritual path because that's not how we like to see things. And it isn't a straight road this leading to some glorious destination either, like some... Um, some, some utopian city on the horizon, some city of the spirit that we're going to and it's all lit up and amazing and we want to go and live there and we can see the way. So it's nothing like that at all. As Choggam Trungpa says, and this quote has often been, um, is often to be found floating around a place, enlightenment is really ego's ultimate disappointment. So what we have here is the path of disappointments be part of ongoing disappointment. As Shogun Trungpa also says somewhere, it's not a glorious path with um, angels singing around each corner. It's disappointment, it's disillusionment. And there isn't this, this quality where we can see things are working out for us in a good way which is what the self-construct likes so much and what that really means it can see a hope for itself a future for itself it can see itself in the future it's there somewhere in a, in a glorified state so the only way to progress is through the continual frustration and and disappointment of everything that we'd hope to attain basically so that's a, a better way of talking about the spiritual path if we wanted to talk about it. And then someone could say, OK, what's the method for obtaining this and um, these conditions, these fruitful conditions for progressing in a spiritual way? How do we go about obtaining these conditions and making sure that they're there for us so that we can um, learn through the disappointment and the um, disillusionment? Is this written in a book anywhere or is it in part of some teachings or something like that? And of course it isn't. It's, there's no need for it to be written down anywhere or if it did, it, became a, it would become a shortcut. If it was formulated or formalised, it would become a shortcut. And it's not stated in nice black and white terms in any teaching. It might be hinted at poetically, but that's a different thing. 
And the reason for that is it's, it's, it's not necessary because life as it actually is, that's what life is for the self-construct. It's a part of never-ending disappointment and disillusionment. That's what it is. And obviously this has to be the case. There's, there's no way that it can't be the case. It's, it's absolutely the case because the function of reality, the, what reality does, if you could say that it does something, which you can't really, but if you could say that it does something, you could say that reality is the, the destroyer of illusions. Because you bring the two things together, the illusion, and then you bring it towards reality. So you, you bring the illusion towards reality, which is going to suffer. So that's bad news for the illusion. It's not bad news for reality. Reality doesn't really, isn't really adversely affected by illusions. It's not bothered by them, really. It doesn't really take them that seriously. On the other hand, when illusion comes across reality or the truth, that's super bad news. And it is always, 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 always going to turn out the worse for the illusion. Eventually, the illusion is going to be destroyed. And that's the one thing we know in life. That's the absolute thing that we can totally rely on. It is been preordained from the very beginning that all illusions shall be destroyed because it's an unequal battle. But the only thing is, of course, that the illusions can postpone the moment of reckoning and postpone it and postpone it. And so there we have the kind of dynamics of everyday life, even though it's inevitable that the ego self is going to suffer disappointments and in the end have to our, the process of our disidentification is going to occur due to the influence of life, which will facilitate this this identification. And so that's one part of the dynamic. And the other part of the dynamic is that we're going to play a long delaying game. Hey, we're going to drag it out as long as possible. <clears throat> and the way we're going to see things is in terms of there is a future, there is a possibility for us to achieve happiness or fulfillment or, or a meaningful life or um, a life that doesn't involve a lot of suffering or a life that involves something good, something um, nutritious and wholesome on the basis of who we all understand ourselves to be, which is this definite identity. So. When we think of life and we happen to be thinking in, in what's called a positive way, this is what it means. The ego construct is projecting itself into the future in such a way that it thinks it stands a chance. And it's saying, yes, this is going to work out. This could work out. Play cards right and it could work out. I think it's going to work out. And then we get the euphoria flash, of course. And that speeds us on our way. So it's it's our positive thinking that facilitates that. And positive thinking, maybe not quite so much now, but was all the rage a while ago. All the rage, positive psychology, positive thinking, positive this, positive that, utterly and completely nauseating. Since all that positivity is only positive for the illusion, which we don't want to see to be illusion, but which Eventually, we will see to be an illusion. Eventually, we're just fighting a losing battle and dragging out the suffering. Making the suffering last longer, making it worse, adding new levels to the suffering, adding new um, convolutions to it. So that's what we're doing. And in terms of mental health, we don't go on about enlightenment or being more spiritual, but we do go on about mental health. 
And so we do imagine that there is such a thing as mental health for the um, self-construct. And that if the self-construct is not enjoying good mental health, it can be possible via strategies to obtain this good mental health. That's it, in a nutshell, really, very, very simple. And the problem with that particular formulation of the situation is that the self construct, the definite identity, is by its very nature absolute impoverishment. Not just a little bit of impoverishment, it's pure absolute impoverishment. That is its nature. As Jesus says in the Gospel of Thomas, it's not that um, you're suffering from some impoverishment. You are the impoverishment. You absolutely are it. It's the um, darkness you carry around with you, and it is you, because you've identified with a fixed thing. So because the fixed viewpoint, which is the self-construct, is fixed, it can't partake in reality because a reality isn't a fixed point and fixed points can't partake in reality. All it can do is project itself out into the world in two ways. The positive way would be things are going to work out for me, then the self-construct gets euphoric. That's like it's kind of shooting up heroin. Or it can project and see bad things happening, which will, it will do that as well, because the two have to balance out and then it'll experience despair and fear and dysphoria. And that's the life of the self-construct. It's either euphoria or dysphoria. Pleasure or pain, as Wei Wei says. That's all it can ever experience. It can't experience good mental health. It can't experience good mental health because good mental health isn't euphoria. It isn't dysphoria. Okay, thanks for watching.